um, in the morning, I sort of just to as as an as a way as an entrance into our into our afternoon session, and we should be done by at least three o'clock. If we are not done by three o'clock, I'll I'll ask for extension from you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in the morning, I don't know whether this question was there in your minds. I deliberately did not touch that because I wanted to catch my time. Um, I, I was very focused in what I wanted us to pull out. That was the begottenness of Christ. And I, I don't know whether you caught it in the presentation that we, the begottenness of Christ has nothing to do with his origins or his nature. It is to do with the work of salvation that he's doing and it's to do with his resurrection and back to the Father is anointed as the king, just like David was anointed in the Old Testament and the language that was used in the Old, te Old Testament on the day that he was anointed, he was, today I've begotten you. So that is the day of Jesus' begottenness. It is when Jesus is adopted in heaven as king and anointed as king. Amen. I guess that if, if you didn't miss the whole gist of the morning presentation, in a few sentences, that's what I was presenting. Now, that out of the way, a question then comes in that we did not answer. I did not even attempt to go there. I started to wanting to, to get into it as I was planning and said, no, this will, this will be confusing. Leave it for the afternoon session. The question then is, are you saying that Jesus, before he is, adopt, before he is resurrected back to heaven, he is not the son of God? Is that what you are saying? You see, when we're investigating the truth, we should not shy away from all questions that come from. In fact, we find the truth when we face all the questions. That, so that's what I, I want to, to at least focus on. If it takes me 10 minutes, um, that's it. That's the focus now. The reason why I'm having this bite-sized is so that we don't get confused in the maze. And we, if we bite too much, we'll get choked. <laughs> So a small piece is enough to get us. I, I sort of had experience last week. We, we, we took a, bit, a big bite and uh, a few prayers there were showing that we were choking on, <laughs> on, on, a, few, on a few things. Okay. When was the plan of salvation hatched? Good Adventists will tell you that before creation. Let's, let's pull that out from scripture. Uh, because I'm not wanting, uh, again, I'm trying to avoid to do as if I'm asking to see whether you know or not. But at the same time, I'm trying to keep a conversation going. Uh, how, how would we support that? From the foundation of the world. Let's hold on to that text. Uh, that's Revelation 13.8. Um, let's read it. By the way, I'm using the other text. Can, could I borrow one of those ones? <laughs> I was beginning to use my one. Okay, Revelation 13.8. Revelation, if you are in the Old Testament, you are in the wrong part of the Bible. <laughs> Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Um, I'm really wanting to read, so that we read this text um, so that it, it, it has meaning in this presentation now. That's page 1183. Page 1183, those with the pew Bibles. Can I have a revolving mic, um, brother, brother Harvey, so that we, we can use some of our young people that read better than I do? Yeah, it's on. It's on. Yeah, read and you, you can pass it on. We'll exchange reading. All who dwell on the earth may... Just a little bit, a little bit higher. Turn it Testify. two notches higher. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, so there is the book of the Lamb that is slain from the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, that that's that was his way of answering my question. Any other person? Why do we say the plan of salvation? 
when we say the plan of salvation, the plan that God had to save us, when was it hatched? Was it when Jesus came to die on earth or when? And he said before the foundation of the world, and I, asked, I accepted that actually it's very true. It's a good answer. But I'm just wanting us to have a little bit of a, a discussion on that without me just you know, going and going and going and going. There was war in heaven at the beginning of time. Yes, um, that war would have... Well, so that necessitated that, well, we can go on to plan to, to, to create. If they, we have this war going on, we can't create if we don't have the, the spanners to fix this kind of thing. Uh, okay. Are you thinking of Ephesians 1-4? I can't think of a Colossians text. Check, check Colossians. Uh, uh, it could be there. But maybe let's go with, with Ephesians, the one that I'm thinking right now. Ephesians 1.4. Uh, who's got the mic now? Okay. Sister Tam is going to read now. Oh, I'm supposed to tell you the page. <laughs> I forgot. You, you, you keep looking for your text, brother. Yeah. I'll stand in one place. <laughs> yeah. That's page 1124. 1124. Just as he chose us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's Ephesians 1, the verses 4. Yes. Sorry, sorry, I, I had seen that some people had not yet found the text. Would you read it again? As he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Okay, powerful. Um, you, 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 you found your, your one? Uh, yes, uh, Colossians chapter 1. Yes. And we can read from verse 15. 15 yeah. Okay, right. Page? Page 1132, those with the Pew Bibles. Okay, no, don't mind. Give it to Maggie, she's got it already. Yeah. Colossians 1.15, give it to her. Mm -hmm. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or domin dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is in who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is, in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Cool, cool. That's a very powerful text, very contextual to what we're talking about. Could someone read verse 19 in the KJV? That same, you read it in the, the, new, KJV, the new King James Version you read, sort of um, still does say what it says, but there's a nuance. All fullness. Say, say that again. Read it. Okay, well, so which means the version I have in mind is not the King James Version that says, in him dwelt the, go the fullness of the Godhead bodily. No, that's Colossians 2.9. Oh, that's 2.19, not 1.19. 2.9, okay, read verse 2.9. Okay. Bodily, okay, there it is, there it is. Okay, 
anyone else with um, the plan of salvation being from the foundation of the world? You have a text? Hebrews 1, 2. An interesting one, that one. Yes, read it. All right. Yeah, that's all right. I'm interested in verse 5 going onwards a little later. We'll hold on to that thought. And the Revelation 13, the Revelation 13, 8, 1. I'm interested in all of those. Let's go um, as a way of, of introducing this. Let's go to First Peter chapter 1 and the verse is 20. First Peter chapter 1 and the verse is 20. Oh, sorry. I'm s if you have found it, please tell us the page. I forgot. 11.62. Who's got it? Yes, you can read it, brother. 20. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days. I have an uh, easier version. I went to that version. Yes. <laughs> God chose him as a ransom long before the world began, but he has now revealed him to you in the last day. Wow, wow. You know, it doesn't really... Um, we, we have struggled with... Um, this version is right, that version is right, but sometimes it's good as a Bible student to have all these versions before you. In fact, the best version is the original language, and we don't read that, we don't understand that. So have all these versions before you, um, and I grew up with the King James Version. Sometimes I use the text, if, you, if I'm quoting them from t the top of my head, is the King James Version that comes out first because of the poetic language and what I grew up with. But it's good to compare these versions and see. That version is making it very simple to understand. Very simple to understand. And I, I'm, I'm curious now, what version is it? <laughs> it's, a it's a living Bible. Yes. Um, th there's no, you, it's, it's a good version to have sometimes. And most of the times uh, when I quote verses and put them on the screen, I first check, I mostly use the living Bible version because it's very simple to understand. Right. Um, we have seen that the plan of salvation, that Christ would come to die for us, was not something that started at the time that Jesus died. For those that um, do not have the, the time conceptualized in their mind, imagine this. Here is the creation of time. Then 2,000 years later, we have the flood. Noah's flood. After 2,000 years, we have Christ. So we've got this period of 4,000 years. All this period, Christ has already accepted that he is going to do what? To die. So Christ knows that this process involves him dying and then Actually, before dying, he has to live first, isn't it? <laughs> it, 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 it? He knows that this plan involves him being born on the planet of Earth. Next week, we're we going to have fun with how he was born, but not now. Um, uh, he has to be born on this Earth and then feel the hunger and the pain of being a human being because he was touched with all our infirmities as a human being. So he grows that, and he knows that when he resurrects, he is not going back into a spiritual body that he was before he was born. He is going to live in, contained in a human body. When we get to heaven someday, when we march into heaven, the human being we are going to see is Jesus. Forever in our human form. Forever. And scars marked on his hand forever. 
That's how, that's how deadly sin is. But that's how wonderful and amazing love is. That Christ is forever going to be like one of us. That's why I keep saying there is no other better deal. No other God could give us this kind of a deal. So, he knew that he was going to go through this. Now, have you ever preached on the pulpit? What if I ask you that next week you're going to be the one who's going to preach? It means the knowledge and the fear of preaching does not start when you start preaching. You are going to live with it from now. So Christ assumes that which he is going to be already now, then before he is it. He is slain at the, at the cross, but he is the lamb that is slain from the foundation of the world. So Jesus is what he is going to be before he is. Is that confusing? It's clear, isn't it? <laughs> yes, he is, going to, he is already what he is going to be. So you will find that even in the book of Daniel, in chapter 7, Jesus is already portrayed as the son of man. But he's not yet the son of man. Then Daniel says, uh, after that I saw one who was like the son of man approaching the throne. And judgment was given to him. Because Jesus is already all oh, in the fiery furnace, the Hebrew boys. You remember? One who was like the son of man, the fourth man. Jesus is already who he is going to be before he is. That's why even in John 3.16, before Jesus has been adopted back to heaven, he is the only begotten of the Father. Having said that, I need to close my Bible now. Let's talk. Let's talk. Where are you at? Let's, let me feel you. Um, in, this, in this place now, this is where I also get to learn. Because what I have presented is what the little I know. There is the little you know. We can put it together. I also do this for my own benefit. Some people might have uh, that little avenue. They will bring it in. Next time when, you present, when I present, you see that it will be a little richer. It's because of you. <laughs> I've borrowed uh, your illustration. Or if you ask me a question that I cannot answer, I will tell you that, hmm, that's a good question. I had not thought about that. Give me time to research. It means next time, now that I've researched about it, next time I present, I'm a little bit wiser and richer. So that's why I normally have this, so that we can talk. Or if you have questions, so go anywhere. There's no structure here now. There's no structure. Questions, additions, observations? Brother Peter. It's not really what you asked for, but I just want to say at the outset that because I've looked at this a lot, yes. the best material that I've found in one place so far is a book by a guy called Glyn Parfit. Do you know that one? Yes. Glyn Parfit right now is in, is in contact with us. Um, he, he is the guy who texted you a message yesterday. Wanting Pastor Tollest's um, um, Queensland. Queensland. It's a big book, a uh, thick book. volume, thick volume like that. Very detailed. Very detailed. Yes. Good luck, yes. You will find it at the ABC. It's a thick volume called um, The Trinity. It's a really, really good book. It's a one-stop shop. It's a one shop. Yes. You get there, you, you will find a lot of interesting stuff. Does that mean like history, theology? Theology and stuff. He doesn't do well in the historical perspective of uh, the stuff that we... I think it's not exactly his focus the historical perspective from the Catholic perspective going, it's not, he doesn't zone in on that. But the historical of Adventism, yes, 
historic Adventism and, uh, and a bit of digging in the text, he does that very well, very well. Mm. Yes, anyone else? Yes. Yes. Good question. Very, very, very tricky one. And I don't mind to answer it. I don't mind to answer it even in a general way. Yeah, yeah. But you, you I, I get your point. In this subject, um, I, w- I'm reluctant to say we have arrived in any subject. Let me tell you why. Uh, Proverbs chapter four. Verses 18. Yes, that's the one. Chapter 4, page 6 or 7. The verse is 18. Anyone? Yes, you can read it, Sister Ray. Chapter 4, verse 18. Yes. Um, so what it means is that, and the other text, before I say what I want to say, the other text is um, Matthew chapter 4, the verses 4. Matthew 4, verse 4. Nine hundred and thirty seven page. But he answered and said to the chief vision, Men shall not live in the house of the Lord, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now just reading that from the original original language, it would say something like this Men shall not live by bread alone but by words that are ever proceeding from the mouth of God. Now, the sense you get there is this. The word of God comes out of his mouth, but this is how I hear it. Say, let's for example here say love. I hear love, 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 love. It gets clearer Deeper and deeper and deeper and more meaningful and more meaningful. So the tense there, those for those that love languages, the grammatical tense there is the present continuous tense. Yes. Yes. Coming forth. Yes. Continuous. So we, we hear more and more and more. I would, say, I would say, as a principle, I think we've got it. But the meaning of it, the, we, we, are, we, are, we appreciate it more. It's, yes, it proceed, it's still proceeding. Um, we, we, we appreciate it deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. You see, this is where I think um, when, you, when you look at reformers like Martin Luther, they had the word of God and they grasped onto it. Now, the followers said our pioneer had the word. 
We are staying where he had it from. And we are not moving on from here. Even though God kept on talking, they, came, they pitched their tents there, they did not want to move. Yet God's voice had moved on. The echo had produced on more meaning and more meaning. Such that even by the time, for example, during, during the time of, of John Calvin, these little farmers and in the villages were doing Bible studies. You know, you should, you should, you should read that, the, the history of that time. These people were, were doing Bible studies in their homes because now what John Calvin had done for them and Martin Luther had done for them was Bible study. We can study the Bible for ourselves. It's no more just the preacher preaching, the priest doing things from up here. The word is active. So these people were having, they had started little fires all over the place. Now they found that there was no justification for baptizing little children. Said we, we shouldn't baptize children. Because the Bible says, teach and then baptize. How can, what does the child understand? So they came up with this. Do you know if you go to, to the um, city of Geneva right now and, and even in Zurich, you will find places where the reformers reformers themselves were persecuting the Baptists for coming up with, with it's, it's, it's surprising how these people, they have suffered persecution themselves for finding the truth. Now they are persecuting this little group of people that have found more truth. It's because they don't want to move on. They don't want to move on. So I, I would say yes and no. Put it this way. In Christ, we, we do not walk towards victory. We walk from victory to victory. So what it is, I would answer and say yes, we are on solid ground, brother. But we can even hear more and appreciate more and let's hunger and thirsty for more because I think what my brothers have done, those that my brothers and sisters that have said, um, well, the pioneers, for me, I hear them as saying, we are pitching our tents here where the pioneers were pitched, you know, that the pioneers were the only mouth peace of God. The last. So we should stem from there. And, and I'm going to say a little bit more in the afternoon next week about how this div has developed in the Adventist church. And I, and, and, and I think your, your question will be, will be answered a bit more. But just for now, yes, I would say there's more to be, to be understood and be appreciated in the doctrine of the Trinity that we, we haven't yet appreciated. You know, I'll give you an example. It's not too long ago. I was listening to Pastor David Ashrick preaching on the, on the Trinity Doctrine, and he brought in a, an angle that I had never thought about and never heard before. And I said, wow, I appreciated it even deeper than I had. He said, if God was a single being, then he can be loved. And I said, yeah, this is true. You know, I don't have to explain it now. You, you, you seem to have caught it. So for me, I think it's two years ago. For me, my, my appreciation of this got even deeper than I had ever appreciated it before. Okay, let's talk more. Brother Christian, you said you had a few things to, to say. You just shoot, just shoot, we'll find it for you. Yeah, Jesus uh, everywhere says that uh, he and the Father are one. Yes. But in one instance, he's just saying that the Father is higher than me. I'm not sure where it is. Yes, it's there in the scriptures. So what would you mean about that? I mean, All right. One Someone who is looking for the text, but the, the text you are talking about is there in the Bible. Um, um, what does Jesus mean when he is saying that? 
Now, Jesus is speaking in the present tense. The text we ended with in the morning said, um, him who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he was equal with God. He was not lesser. So this text is not contradicting the one that's where Jesus says, I'm lesser, and where he is appealing to his father. It's, it's not like that. But what Jesus has done in that, in that text in Philippians chapter 2, what Jesus has done is he has condescended, and this, my sense of, the, of, 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 of condescending here is that he has humbled himself. Now he has become a human being just like you and I. The only difference is that without sin. He has become a human being and now he is speaking the language that we speak. I think it's Romans chapter 5 and the verses 10 that says by his life and by his death we are saved. So he is living our life and conquering in our life. You get that? So his prayer and his statement his, his, is only representing his nature at this time. Not his nature. Remember in John 17, 5 that we read, he even then says, now glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. Then he was equal with God. But now he's a human being, so he's speaking from that perspective. All right, just read it for us. Yes. Oh well, I, the point has been made. I, th that that's the text. Yes, it's as I said, it's a text that is there. You know. These things, when we really think about them, they actually show the love of God through Christ. You know, he was, we do not have a high priest who is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities because he became, he became humans like, like us. He became human like us, not humans. He became human like us. So he is speaking from that perspective of being a human being. Yes. Yes. You also find that um, uh, it's interesting how when Thomas in the Gospel of John he says to Jesus Go to it. It's, it's chapter 20, I think the verse is 17. Yes. Verse 28. 20, 28. 1050. Page 1050. My God. My God. So here he's recognizing Jesus as God. Right? What language do you think um, do you think Thomas would have said this in? Oh, you mean the original of, co uh, with, of course, it's recorded in Greek, but uh, Thomas was not a Greek speaker. He was Aramaic. So what language? What? 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 So he would have said this. Jesus was not Greek, was not Greek speaking either. So th this, this is a conversation that is happening in Aramaic. So when he says, my Lord, my God, which words do you think he would have used for Lord and for God? Yes, from the Old Testament. So which word is Lord translated from? Yahweh. Well, yes, yeah. not exactly Elohim, but Eli. How do I know this? Because Jesus at the cross does not address Elohim. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthan. Which means Jesus now knows that in heaven the person he's addressing is not the 
Th- this is an argument we... Okay, someone is preaching while I'm preaching. <laughs> That's all right. Um, there's an argument that says when we say Elohim is plural, some say, well, it's because you don't understand that the Hebrew language has a way of reverence and honoring by pluralizing. Did you get my sense? Some would say, I don't know in your language, but in my language, it's true, actually. In my language. If I was addressing you, Peter, I have had to learn to call a person like you, Peter. In my language, I would have to use your surname, but before your surname, I would put a prefix. That prefix is actually pluralizing your name. That is a way of respecting because we can't call an elderly person by first name in in my culture. Never. You never do that. So, but again, I would not just say Smith. If I said Smith to you, it means you are my age mate. So I would have to put a prefix, Va Smith. That prefix is actually a prefix of making it a plural. So they make this argument, but then the problem comes when you look at Jesus addressing a singular person, a single person in heaven, he calls him Eli, not Elohim. So what, what, going back to what Thomas was saying. Yes. So Thomas would have said maybe Eli, my God, Eli, my Lord, Yahweh. Yes, that's the point. Well, if that's the case, then he's either addressing God. Who is Yahweh. Right, who is Yahweh himself. Or he's, he's making an idol of him. That's, that's, the, that's the point. Yeah, so in that basis, uh, from that conclusion, we, we can't say that he was using words to put Jesus any lower than what he is. Correct. Correct. So that takes... So God. actually... That says, borrowing, stealing your thunder. What it means is that the accusation of the Jews to the, um, to, to the disciples is you are making God of a human being. That's right. The, the words is what confirms the truth. That's right. Correct. And this is why Judaism could not m- move on to Christianity because for them, this was idolatry. Well, that's what uh, Paul says they've got to bail. Correct. That's what taken away in Christ. Um, look this one up for me, CP. I think it's in John chapter 5 or chapter 6 towards the end where uh, Jesus has said to the disciples, before Abraham I am. And the Jews wanted to kill him. John 8. John 8. Okay, John 8, 44 is the, you are your father the devil. (laughs) 10, 39. Which is which, brothers? (laughs) They are over... 8.58. 8, 8.58. 10.36. Let's read it. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, you see, I'm not going to burden you with language stuff here. Let me just speak about it from, from, from the surface. What happened after that? Can you read? What happened? Wanted to kill him. Let's just say the Jews had heard that Jesus was saying he was there before Abraham. What was their likely reaction? 
Abraham has been living, has been dead for almost 1,700 years. And you see, not even 40 years old. Well, do you think this would have been a cause for, for an uproar? To say that you, you are older than someone who is 1,700 years dead? That's what, so the point I'm trying to make, you're right. So the point I'm trying to make is that if, he, if what they had heard was he's saying he's older than Abraham, they would have laughed at him. This guy has lost his mind. Come and let him go. But what they heard was this guy is making himself Yahweh. That's what he's making himself. So Jesus himself claimed to be Yahweh. He claimed to be Yahweh. So by his own claiming. Well, we, we, we had gone a few other places there. But any other observations or questions? I'm at the three o'clock mark. I, I want to have a few closing remarks, but um, before we go there. Well, then in Colossians it talks about the, that he has preeminence and it talks about the word firstborn. Yeah, yeah, I was going to close with that. I was going to close with that. Um, but I, I just wanted to welcome a few more thoughts and questions. I hope what we have come up with today, we haven't talked about the Holy Spirit yet. There's no dispute about the Father. So what we have come up with today, the, the objective for today was to establish the divinity of Jesus. That Jesus is very God. Amen. In fact, I think the page is 530 in the book Desire of Ages. There's somewhere that says that the divinity of Jesus is the sinner's assurance of salvation. The divinity of Jesus is the sinner's assurance of salvation. I could be rephrasing it or paraphrasing it there, but something to do, something like that. Mm-hmm. And they're talking about Christ. About Christ coming. Correct. That's right. That's right. You know, my friends, as we come to an end, I hope I'm not closing anyone out. Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you with that last week, but le- le- this is my to yes, yes, le- let's get the, that richness, yes. where they are coming from. Well, on that point, any of us here in this room can ask ourselves this question. Would you accept anything less than God, than God on the cross? Mm. You know, especially... Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's God or nothing. I can't accept anything less than God on the cross. In fact... It has to be God himself. You it remind me of a conversation I had with... I think I've told you a story of, of, a, of an atheist that I had a conversation with some, t- some day at, a, at a, um, an airport. One of his accusations was, you know, this God of yours that you, because he had discovered I was a pastor, he said, you know, this God of yours, the problem I have with him is that he is so much like the other gods that are fairy tales that are mythical. And I said, in what way? Then he says, these other gods, they like 
human sacrifices. Same story, the human sacrifice of Jesus appeases your God. And I thought, all right, this is why Jesus is God. Because if God has to be appeased by a creature, you get my point? If God has to accept a creature as sacrifice so that his anger is abated. Therefore, number one, therefore he is like all the other mythical gods that want human sacrifice. So he, he, in, in sort of a funny way, he gave me that thought. And I said, okay, now that's why I believe that Jesus is God. So I paused back to him and I said, what if the person who died at the cross was God? And so he said to me, that's, that's nonsensical. And I said, why do you say that? Well, we, I could not really get through to him because this was really hard for him to conceptualize that it was God who was dying at the cross. We had given himself to die at the cross. The reason why it's nonsensical to him is that the very fact of love, one, the number one principle of love is selflessness. It's giving of myself. If, if you are in love with Harvey, and he can sacrifice to be with you. He sends you a friend or his brother. Then there's something wrong with that. You really need to be picked up at the end. Every time you need to be picked up, he sends his brother because he's busy playing a game. <laughs> <laughs> no, Harvey doesn't do that. <laughs> he doesn't do that. That's the wrong thing with examples. <laughs> so what it means is that he really cannot sacrifice for you. He would rather use someone else to say. But if it's his own person that is doing this, then you understand their love. So if, if it's God who died at the, at, the, at the cross, I guess you, you understand what I'm saying. If it's God who gave himself. Number two, the other principle that is there, therefore, if God had to create a human being to appease his anger. Therefore, God, the doctrine of righteousness by works stands that he wants us to offer something so that he can, he can accept us. But if it is God who is offering himself, he is saying, look, your salvation does not take you, it takes me. So that's different. That's different. Other gods would say, search for me and you'll find me. But this God, if it's, it's God who died at the cross, what it means is that it's God chasing after us. So uh, that's why I'm saying I cannot accept that it's a, it's, it's, it's a lesser being that is dying. That makes God a tyrant. That makes God a tyrant. So in this statement in Colossians chapter 1, this is how we can understand it. We can understand it to mean that Jesus, on the day, I don't know which day it was, when this topic had to come, I think Zechariah calls it the, the, the Council of Peace. The Council of Peace where the three of them in their oneness had to come up with the plan of salvation. And Jesus has to die. Now God cannot die. So how is he going to die? Because what is at stake, my friends, look at it this way. And I should be done in the next five minutes. I promise you. There are two things about the character of God. There are many other things, but two right now are coming to my mind. 
Number one, his holiness. And number two, his love. His holiness says, I cannot live with sin. All right? Holiness just cannot exist together with sin. Love does not destroy. Correct? All right. So if man sins, how can God coexist with the sin of man without frustrating his holiness? If man sins and God destroys him, how can he destroy without frustrating his love attribute? You get the catch 22 there. So, if God, to, 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 to maintain the two things, love and justice, love and holiness, if it's himself, who is taking the punishment upon himself, then he is saying, sin is so deadly. I still, sin still has to be paid for. Justice has been satisfied. Are you there with me? But if man walks away without suffering the punishment, then love is sustained. I don't know whether this is making sense. That's my way of seeing it. So what is at stake in this subject? It is salvation itself. That's why I think it's an important subject. That's why I think it's an important subject. And I think the devil is going to try and play tricks on us in the last days and use a lot of arguments and the reason why we are doing this what did he say what did timothy say so that we can be established in the truth he says paul says to the church at at ephesus so that we may not be like children being tossed about by every wind of doctrine these are the last days church we need to stand on the word of god May God bless you. Um, I'm reluctant because it's got a pass for us to sing, but maybe we can pray and call it a day. Next week, in the morning, the subject will be on the Holy Spirit. Is it an influence or is he a being? That's the subject. And then in the afternoon, historic Adventism. In the afternoon, we might go more than an hour next week because I'll take maybe 45 minutes to do a presentation a full presentation without interruption, and then maybe 44, 45 more minutes to discuss. All right, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this afternoon. We are coming to a place where we understand that you love us. Even now, after doing this Bible study, we know that your love is so high up there for our small minds to wrap around it. But Father, let it suffice to know that you love us. I don't know where we are this afternoon. Some of us, Father, have gone through a rough week and we have even doubted whether you love us. Some of us, Father, we are going through some difficulties in the family. Some of us are going through maybe some ailments in our bodies. And we wonder where you are. But Father, the subject is giving us a reassurance that you could not be kept away from your children. Not even sin could separate you with your children. You chased after us. And Father, we come out of our hiding. The clothes fig leaves that we have put for ourselves, we cast them away so that you can clothe us with your righteousness. 
Be with us now as we get into this week. If it is your will, Father, the challenges we met last week, may you put them away. But Father, if it pleases you that they stay, may your strength be shown in our weaknesses. Give us enough stamina to go through it. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.